الله يا شباب اليوم ما عشان محاضرة الاسينكرونوس اللي هي معناها غير متزامن راح نظر نعرض لكم عدد من الفيديوهات اللي هي جودة هنا هنا في عندنا يعني فيديو ما لهوش علاقة مباشرة في السستينابيليتي لكن خلينا نشوف الفكرة اللي بيحكي فيها مايك سينيك سايمون سينيك planet knows what they do 100% Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking, thinking differently. differently. The no way one. we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple, simple to use, use and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Y entonces, Dr. González, ¿me va a elegir a mí? No, elíjame a mí. No. Eh, eh, no me gusta tu chasis. Y no me gustan las rubias. Entonces, ¿yo soy la elegida? Vamos a ver el video Fanny. Con... Uh, he's had more than 30 million uh, views and he's إذا قبل ما يبدأ الفيديو الثاني لاحظنا بأنه سايمون سينيك والفيديو تبعه هذا انسبايرنج يعني عليه مليونز اوف فيوز بيتكلم عن انه زي ما ما شفتوا انه الناس ما بتشتري الشيء اللي بدك اياه الا اذا كان في بيربس في واي اوكي ذي دونت باي وات يو دو ذي ار نوت انترستد ان باينج وات يو دو ان هاو يو دو ات بس ذي باي وات ذي باي ذي باي واي يو دو ات ذا بيربس اوف ذا برودكت يعني ايش المنتج بده يعمل لك ويقدم لك وهذا فكره ممتاز جدا من ناحيه الماركتنج لكن 
في هذا الفيديو ملاحظ بانه ولو انه مش صوته وحكيه هذا مش انسبايرنج زي هذاك لكن ركزوا لي على المعلومات اللي بحكيها شو عم بحكي هون هذاك اقوى من ناحيه ال As a student, I was really fascinated by why people buy stuff. And I studied marketing and cultural anthropology, and there was one concept that really struck out for me, it struck out with me. It was called self-image congruence. It kind of said what we bring into our life reflects who we are or who we want to be. So let's, let's reflect on that. What we buy reflects who we are or who we want to be, either kind of our true identity or our aspirational self and its choices. These choices power business. More than two-thirds of our global carbon emissions come from business choices. So I want to talk about the relationship between us as consumers and how businesses work and what's behind the mirror. Many of you have heard this amazing talk by Guy Simon Sinek. Uh, he's had more than 30 million uh, views, and he's saying people don't buy what you make. I'll tell you that more than 30 million people have seen this talk on TED Talk or TEDx. They buy why you make it. I agree with that, but I'm also fascinated by that missing link how stuff is made, because these things all fit together as a system. And it's very important, I think, to understand them holistically. The how is what's behind our level of emissions in the world, our level of waste in our world, and our ethics, social ethics, animal welfare, and environmental ethics. And it's all driven by us on the other side. This group of people, this people in this room, people around the world, who are just trying to struggle with this idea of who we, who we are or who we want to be. For 70,000 years, we were progressing along, and then the Industrial Revolution hit, and everything got thrown in the air. We discovered mass production. We could make all kinds of things that we didn't have access to beforehand. But something powerful and quite profound happened. We changed our relationship to nature. We shifted from nature being our home, our environment, to seeing nature as a resource. It went from being constrained by resources to suddenly resources being perceived as unlimited. This has been exacerbated by our nesting habits. We live in cities that compress time and space. It's a bubble of our own design. I live in a city, I love it, it's exciting, it unlocks creativity, it's sociable, but it's very separate from nature. It's not how we were designed originally. So these two forces, seeing nature as a resource and becoming separate from nature, are changing how businesses work and changing what we buy. Nature for me has a lot of answers and the first time I got really exposed to that was when I was staying with families that live in the high country in the mountains of New Zealand, sheep farmers. And I learnt that nature is a collection of ecosystems, an interconnected connection of ecosystems, of organisms interacting with their environment. It was the triangulation between the animals, the environment, and the people that really captured me. It was a mini ecosystem uh, in itself. I was very really inspired by that, and it really brought to my mind three natural laws that I want to share with you in terms of how I've built my own business, Icebreaker. Symbiosis, sustainability, and adaptation. I believe that if we can harness these natural laws from nature and apply them back to businesses, we can build better, stronger businesses. My journey started in 1994, when I was 24. I met an American girl. 
and she toured New Zealand. She stayed on a merino ranch and really wanted me to meet the farmer. I lived in the city. I thought, what do I want to meet a farmer for? Um, but it was a profound experience. And he gave me a T-shirt made out of merino wool. It wasn't as cool as this one. It was like white. It had stains on it. But it felt amazing. I put that on. It was nothing like, you know, the old itchy stuff. It felt gorgeous. I went running in it. I went mountain biking in it. Didn't hold odour, regulated my temperature. And all I'd worn before for outdoor stuff was synthetics, human synthesising nature, polypropylene, polyester. This was totally different. I was very moved by that experience. Uh, this is what was behind that. It's an animal, the merino sheep, in itself an adaptation. Regular sheep live down here. These guys adapted to live in the mountains, and with that there was a change in performance quality of the fibre. This was great for me because wool was a big part of my life. This is my first sheepskin, Lammy. Uh, I ate it as part of the teething process. Uh, I also had a problem to solve. I had a litany of bad outdoor looks. <laughs> that culminated in the 90s with my one-piece ski suit. So the real, probably the real reason I started Icebreaker was to sick of being dressed by my mother. <laughs> So here I was, uh, my first little uh, shared office, 1995. We had the what. We had an amazing high-performance natural product. And we had the why. We wanted to build a business to give people a natural product. <coughs> والهاو بجوز في الوقت الحاضر نتيجة لأهمية البيئة أهم من الواي والوات فنحن عم نشوف إنه إذا طلعنا على الواي ومنشترك كثير مع ناس أو هم بيأخذون على الواي لما نطلع على الوقت الحاضر هو زي ما طلع كتاب اسمه فن التفاهة أو نظام التفاهة بتمنى بتمنى تقرأوا هذا الكتاب نظام التفاهة نظام التفاهة بيأخذنا على مثلا الواي اللي بنشترك فيها مع مع المجتمع اللي حكاها سايمون سينيك واللي هي تسويقية بحتية ما لهاش علاقة في الإثيكس وفي قضايا مشابهة بيأخذنا على طفل عمره 10 سنوات أو 12 سنة وعنده مكاسب بالملايين بيكسب شهريا مئات الألوف من خلال التفاهة على اليوتيوب من خلال بث أشياء سخيفة جدا بيشوفها الناس وهذا كمان زي أذى للبيئة وأذى للثقافة وللقيم وللعادات والتقاليد اللي بتنزل بالواحد لمستوى رديء جدا من التفكير ومن الضحالة فالتلوث هو ليس التلوث فقط أو الأذى على البيئة أو الـ environmental harm هو فقط physical sometimes we have also cultural uh, ethical uh, educational uh, levels uh, بتكون مستواها متدني uh, جدا فهو بيحكي لنا عن الـ what والـ why والـ how لكن هو بيحط question mark كبيرة على الـ how أرجو متابعة الفيديو طويل كثير هو يعني Natural choice in an age of synthetics because here all the outdoor gear was synthetic. What about the how? I didn't know how to make stuff. What I'd inherited because I bought the idea and the farmer became a shareholder and I'd inherited a very basic kind of prototype. We bought some yarn, made some fabric, chopped it up, made some garments and it worked for a little bit. In 1997, uh, I, got a, I got a letter from a merino wool grower, and she said, uh, you're a disgrace to the industry. This top, which is supposed to be awesome, fell apart. And I was so shocked, I didn't know what happened. What had actually happened was that the wool that was in the yarn, we were only buying yarn, 
it was a bad batch of wool. The reason it was a bad batch of wool is because it was breaking. The reason it was breaking is because the animals weren't healthy. The reason the animals weren't healthy was because the environment wasn't providing them the sustenance they need. That's when I realised that looking beyond and challenging every stage in the supply chain would reveal opportunities, sometimes real challenges too. So thinking about this symbiosis, how organisms work together for the benefit of the ecosystem. What the farmers needed at the time uh, reminded me a little bit of the first rule of business. To get what we need, we need to give others what they need. They were part of an auction system. They'd sell, they'd sell their wool uh, on international markets. They didn't know if they were going to make a profit or a loss. What we needed was high quality product with clear ethics behind it. So we set up a long term contract system that has been the foundation. We've worked with up to 200 families, we buy around 1,000 tonnes a year, and we pay a price out to three years in advance. That it lets them make long term planning decisions and gives us what we need in terms of quality and the ethics behind it. But that's just only the start. There are three principles that I learnt. Traceability, we have to know where our raw materials come from. Ethics, through purchasing those raw materials, we have to have clear ethics. And visibility, if you put a middleman or something like that in the middle, they were there optimised to get the cheapest stuff on, and that's how you cut corners. A friend of mine used to run a global uh, drinks business. Their policy was they had to buy sugar from a middleman, and that had to buy from a middleman, because with two levels of obscurity, they didn't have to take responsibility for the sugar. That's the antithesis. Three people came into my life. Janine Benyus, Michael Braungart and Peter Senge. They were all speaking at a conference I was helping organise in New Zealand. And they each gave me insights for the next stage of our journey around biomimicry, around taking responsibility for additives in the supply chain and thinking holistically as a business as an interconnected web of biomimicry around taking responsibility for two levels of obscurity, they didn't have to take responsibility for the sugar. That's the antithesis. Three people came into my life. Janine Benyus, Michael Braungart. Okay, I'm going to stop Peter Singh, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you. في كتابه اللي هو Learning Organization ممكن uh, I mentioned this before uh, maybe uh, كتاب له, uh, اللي هو في Learning Organization one of the best books in about Learning Organization which is titled The Fifth Principle uh, of uh, the Learning Organization The Fifth Principle اللي هو System Thinking وانا بحكي لنا عن System اسمه بيتر سينجي not Peter Singer بتعرفوا الترجمة هون بيقضوها زي ما بيسمعوها وهو لغته نيوزيلندية صعبة شوية فهذه بس هذا الرجل مؤثر جدا أنا فيه شخصيا اللي هو هون بيتر سينجي أو بيتر سينج كتابه اللي هو في Learning Organization I had a conference I was helping organize in New Zealand and they each gave me insights for the next stage of our journey around biomimicry around taking responsibility for additives in the supply chain and thinking holistically as a business as an interconnected web of, of systems. Because our next challenge was about sustainability. It was about how we reduce waste and create the most efficient ecosystem. Because I had a big problem. Sales were growing, but the supply chain we had based in New Zealand was collapsing. I did a global search around the world and we looked across America, we looked across Asia, we looked across Europe. The worst manufacturing I found was in China. Old school polluters cutting costs. The best manufacturing I found was in China. A new breed of highly efficient, highly ethical, 
companies with the best technology in the world. That taught me this key insight. It's not where it's made, it's how it's made. It's actually the ethics behind the partners. So in that quest to build us a supply chain, we got so many choices. We got waves and waves of choices. And I need something to guide me the whole time, all the way through. And it was that exploration, it was that asking what was behind the product and how they made it, that's how we managed to build the supply chain 13 years later, which still I'm proud of, and we're working on, and we're improving, but we've got the foundations in a strong place. Another person that really amazed me was Ray Anderson and his turnaround of interface carpets. He says it was a disgrace. We were a plunderer of the earth because they're an old school polluter. Yet through a focus program, they reduced fossil fuels by 60% and got water usage down by three quarters. It just reminded me, you know, this stuff is really hard, but it takes an intention. It takes a consciousness for a company to take on a search and to harness some of these laws to see how businesses can be stronger. It's very much a journey. We even got it nailed, and we're constantly faced with trade-offs. For example, we have a product that has a little bit of nylon in it. It does that because it makes it last twice as long, but it reduces the biodegradability and your customer, and on the other side, the environment. This is where the real power, either who we are, this is where the real power lies. All businesses die if they're not powered by consumers. It's about the balance between these two worlds. I'd like to leave you with this question then. As we go forward, as you think today, and hopefully think for the rest of your life, this question, who are we as a species, and what do we want our world to be? It is our choice. Thank you. responsible for all the in the production of electricity. So they've got a problem. But what a response. They buy Solar City and integrate it into their business. They're extending their ecosystem to not only yeah, to not contribute to the problem, but to help solve it. We have a fantastic turnaround opportunity around renewables. So in summary, your business just isn't the cool bit. It's not the why and the what, it's the how. Imagine a line between these things, an integration, a holistic integration between how a business is made because the why of a company, the real integrity, is just as much the products as the system behind it. When we're trying to balance these two things, we've got the how responsible for all the uh, emissions in the world, but also that is the opportunity to make the most difference and reduce those. By embracing these three laws from nature, I believe we can build stronger, cleaner businesses by introducing concepts such as symbiosis, sustainability and adaptation. In thinking like nature, business itself can overcome this gulf and start reconnecting. And it's not about being perfect. It's about being on the journey for better. And us, on the other side, here we are, buying or choosing not to buy stuff which is reflecting either who we are or who we want to be. This is where the real power lies. All businesses die if they're not powered by consumers. It's about the balance between these two worlds. I'd like to leave you with this question then. As we go forward, as you think today, and hopefully think for the rest of your life, this question, who are we as a species, and what do we want our world to be? It is our choice. Thank you. Okay, then, uh, I'm going to talk about integration between how and why and what. وبتكلم أيضا عن يعني العملية اللي بتتم أو تمت في بعد الثورة الصناعية 
and trying to squeeze uh, the, the, eco, the ecosystem to the benefit of mankind without uh, any type of natural balance between uh, these uh, three uh, concepts. فلذلك العودة إلى الطبيعة بطريقة منطقية بطريقة فيها بالانس والآن نتركه مع فيديو مؤثر أو مهم وملاحظ أن هذا الفيديو عليه 37.9 or almost 40 million views أوكي ونحاول يكون في هذا الفيديو طبعا أيضا في ترجمة والفيديوهات ممكن نحط اللينك تبعهم على الموقع تبعنا على الاي ليرنينج في هذا المكان على الاي ليرنينج نتركه ل 90% of all the product that we make every year for packaging which is only used probably for one short time at the very beginning of its life cycle it was then wasted thrown away leads to be sustainable but nobody wants to pay for it. Now, admittedly, that's a really aggressive statement. It's extreme. Everyone and no one, but I stand by it. Let me give you a little bit of background. So when I think about everyone, I mean, when we think about tomorrow, we don't want things to fall apart. We want to at least maintain, if not improve, our current standard of living. And I think I'm on pretty safe ground by saying that everybody wants that. And then as far as nobody wants to pay for it, if I asked for a raise of hands and said all of your purchases are going to go up tomorrow, how many of you guys want to do that? I didn't see any hands. So, nobody wants to pay for it. What I want to do today is raise awareness that when we don't intentionally pay for sustainability, we pay for it in unintentional ways. And I want to give you an example from the plastics industry. And what I put here on the screen is a ideal cycle of plastic production and usage. In an ideal world, we would produce plastic and then we would use it and we would reuse it and then when it breaks, we would repair it and when we can't repair it anymore, we would recycle it and start the cycle over again. We would only produce plastic if we needed more in the chain. Unfortunately, this is not what happens. The World Economic Forum, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and McKinsey and Company did that study and they published it a few years ago. And in this diagram you see a, a circle. And what they did is they said how much plastic is made in the world just for packaging. And they said on an annual basis we produce as a society 78 million tons of plastic for packaging every year. Now, if you follow that loop around the top, and if we just go clockwise for a minute, you see that 2% of it makes its way all the way back around. 2% makes its way in a closed loop recycling. That means that closed loop recycling, that's basically a bottle. Starts as a bottle, and then after I've used it, and I've recycled it, and I've produced something else again with it, it's a bottle again. So it stayed in the same quality. Now, some things were captured for recycling, but they were downgraded or cascaded recycling. This means that we started with the bottle, but when we finished the cycle, we actually made a carpet or some other lower quality item that we're probably not going to recycle back up to a bottle. Now, if you do the math on that, that was only 10% that, that's really even getting recycled. If we take it a little bit further though, what, what happens to the rest? 4% of it was lost in the recycling effort. You see that at the top. Now if you go a little bit further down, we took 14% of it and incinerated it. That means that we burned it to produce energy. And you can imagine what that did for our carbon footprint. Now it gets worse because 40% is landfilled every year. That means 40% of the plastic that we made for packaging we end up digging a hole, we put it all in there, and then we cover it over with dirt and hope to forget about it. But it gets worse because at the end we have 32% that is leakage. 32% of the plastic that we make every year for packaging 
leaks into our environment. That means it goes into our oceans, our rivers, our streams, our parks. It ends up in the environment that we live in. That's pretty ugly. In fact, if we take the math a little bit further on that, right? Our track record on plastic packaging is 90% waste. That means 90% of all the product that we make every year for packaging, which is only used probably for one short time at the very beginning of its life cycle, it was then wasted, thrown away, leaked into the environment, burned. Put it a different way, that means that we got 10% right. Could you imagine going home to your mom and dad in grade school and saying, I got 10% on my math test today? That's an F. In fact, that's not an F. That's a super F. That's, that's bad news. And, and if, if you're not familiar with the, the letter grading that some schools use, F is a failure. That's really, really poor. And that's what's happening with us in the plastics life cycle right now for packaging. We are failing. If you want to put it into financial terms, it's about $100 billion a year. Who would be satisfied with spending $100 billion and then throwing it away every year? But that's what we do, and we shouldn't be satisfied. We can't be satisfied with numbers like that. So then the next question is, why are we using plastic at all? Can't we get rid of plastic? Well, it's a little bit harder than that. When you look at plastic, it's actually quite useful. And let me just put, put together this, the story for plastic a little bit. It's durable. We know it's sturdy. If I drop it on the ground, it's not likely to break as opposed to my glass jar. It's resistant to chemicals. I can put all sorts of things in my plastic bottle, but I probably can't do that with my metal bottle. Um, it can handle high and low temperatures. For example, I put my food when I'm done with it into a, a plastic container. Then I take that container and I stick it in my freezer at below freezing temperatures. Then I pull it out of that container, or out of the freezer, and I stick it in my microwave and jack the temperature back up. Plastic can handle those swings in temperatures. It's a really great substance. It's also lightweight. When I think about plastic, I, I'm a finance guy. So when I think about it in terms of shipping costs, if I'm putting something in, in a very lightweight container and shipping it around, I'm paying a lot less fuel. I'm also having a lot smaller carbon footprint because of all the fuel costs of trying to move things around. It's versatile. Plastic can take any shape, any form, just about any color. And it's recyclable. We know we're not good at it. 10% good is, is not good yet, but I believe we're going to get better. And it's affordable. It's cheaper than wood, it's cheaper than metal, it's cheaper than glass. So when it comes down to it, why do companies, why do we still use plastic? There's a number of reasons. So then is there anything that we can do to fix the problems of plastic then? Well, when I look at the problems of plastic, I see two two main problems. The first problem is that it's made from oil at the beginning of its life cycle. We're taking a limited resource on this earth and we're using it all up to create something that we just throw away. The second problem with plastic, and we've already talked about it, is at the end of its life cycle we throw it away, it's wasted, it pollutes our environment. Is there any way that we can improve that? And there's actually a lot of ways that we can improve that. There are a number of companies out there, a number of technologies that people are trying to work on and improve this, these two issues. One I'm just going to mention tonight is bioplastics. And when you throw bio at the beginning of a term, it sounds really exciting. But what does it really mean? So let's define what a bioplastic is. It's one of two things. It's either bio-based, means that it was made from something that can be grown over and over. We didn't make it out of oil, which is a limited resource. We made it from sugar or corn or something that we can make over and over and over. An example out there is actually bio-PE. So there's a plastic that's bio-based. Or if it's in the bioplastics realm, it could also be biodegradable. 
That means at the end of its life cycle, when we throw it away, it'll actually break down and become food for microorganisms. Think a tree that falls over in the forest, it breaks down and becomes food for other things. And there's an example of that, PBAT. Um, there's also a plastic that's pretty exciting called PLA that's both biodegradable and biosourced. So there's a plastic out there that can solve both of our problems. It's environmentally friendly on the front end and it's, it's uh, good for the environment on the back end. This is, this is great news. So you're probably asking yourself three questions. And if you're not, I hope you are. I'm going to point out the three questions right now. One, why haven't I heard about PLA? Two, why haven't all plastics been converted to PLA? And three, why is a finance guy giving us this, tech, this presentation on a new technology? Okay, it's fair. Those three questions I'm going to ask you to hold on to them for just a minute, and I want to talk to you about how decisions are made. Economists for years have been talking to us about self-interest. They said that whenever we make a decision, we make it based on our own self-interest. We want to know what's in it for me, with them. What's in it for me when I make a decision, when I make an investment on my, with my personal finances? I want to know what's in it for me. A lot of times we unfortunately break this down to just money. We think what's in it for me, I, I'm going to get rich. But there's a lot of other things that could be in it for you. For example, if we go back to that plastics example, if you take your plastic bottle, you have a choice. You could throw it away in the black bin and it just goes to landfill or maybe incineration. Or you could take that plastic bottle and you can stick it in the blue bin for recycling. Maybe you put it in the blue bin because it just makes you feel good. You feel like you're making a difference in the world. That's what's in it for you sometimes. It's not just all about money. Now, if we as individuals are looking at our own self-interest, and our self-interest is broader than just money, I would propose that corporations act in their own self-interest as well. And it's not always just about money. In fact, corporate boards are made up of individuals, just like you and me. And I want to talk to you about decisions that are made in boardrooms. And my experience in boardrooms is the people that are in those rooms are trying to figure out what's in it for them, but they're also good people that are trying to make a difference in the world. They're trying to improve the, the world around them. But boards have a lot of decisions they've got to make. And so they've got to boil the decisions down quickly into a matter that they can do something with. And they might look at criteria like intangibles. You know, what's going to be the PR impact? You know, what's going to be the impact on the environment? What's going to be the impact on our employees? Do our customers care about this? And how do we best meet the needs of our customers? They might also look at an internal rate of return, or what's my return on this investment? If I invest this money, am I going to get 10% back? Am I going to get 2% back? You know, what, what, what's my return? They might also look at a payback period. What is the amount of time that it's going to take for me to recoup the cost that I put in originally for the investment? They also look at net present value. What's, if I add up all the amount that I'm going to get for the investment, and then I subtract from that all the costs that I have to put into the investment, that's a net present value. So when you look at these, you're probably looking at it thinking, well, those last three are all very, very money heavy. They're finance heavy. And, and yeah, they are because the boards have to make quick decisions. And this is important. I want you guys to remember this, that the amount of money available is always smaller than the number of ideas to invest in. So every board out there might have 50 ideas that they can invest in, but they've got to only, or maybe they only have money to invest in two. So you've got to boil it down quickly, and sometimes the financial metrics are the ones that, that, uh, that drive some of the decisions. With that in mind, though, now that we understand how boards might be making decisions, I want to talk about other groups that might be thinking about this WIFM decision, specifically around plastic. If I'm thinking about plastic, and I've heard about this new technology, PLA, 
what might I be doing about it? Well, if you're a PLA producer, and full disclosure, I work for a company that makes PLA. So we'll, I'll tell you, what we talk about in our boardroom is how much can we sell? How much can we make? And if we make it, what, what can we sell it at? What are people willing to, to pay? And, and what are our costs going to be? Can we even make money on this? Because if we make the bad decision, our company will not be in business in a year. If we make the wrong decisions, our company is not sustainable. So sustainability is important in the boardroom too. Other groups that might be thinking about this are plastic users. So if I think about a plastic user, people that buy plastic, they're wondering, if I buy this new technology, PLA, and I turn around and, and sell it to my customers, can I recoup the costs that I put into it? Are my customers willing to pay for it? And maybe even more importantly, if I don't offer PLA, are my customers going to go elsewhere? Will I lose business out of this? Another group that's thinking about this decision is consumers, and we're all consumers. The way that we address this question is, am I willing to pay a premium for a, a plastic that is actually good for the environment? Am I willing to vote with my dollars for a better environment in the future? And ultimately, which companies am I willing to reward with my purchasing power? Because when you make a decision with your dollars, or your euros, or your remembies, whatever, whatever currency you're using, you're making a statement to other companies and saying, this is what I want more of. I want you to make more of this because this is what I'm willing to buy. Other people that are involved in this decision, they're struggling with this decision, be recyclers. And remember, recyclers, they do the dirty work, right? They're the ones that have to take all of our trash, separate it, and then try to create something that's going to be of value because they need to be sustainable as well. They need to make enough profit to keep them in business, to pay their employees. And finally, governments are involved too. Governments are trying to decide what behaviors they want to encourage and which ones they want to discourage. Ultimately, what do their constituents reward with their votes? So with that in mind, we have a lot of people that are struggling with this decision. I want to come back to those three questions I asked you to hold on to. So why haven't I heard about PLA? One of the main reasons is it's a relatively new technology. It's only been around for a few years now. And quite frankly, it's going to take time for something like this to build up in the consciousness of the consumer. It's going to take time for people who make things out of plastic to, to realize its benefits and to put them in, into practice. The second question is, why haven't all plastics been converted to PLA? Well, if you think about it, there's only a, a few companies right now that currently make PLA. Their total production is less than 0.1% of the annual plastic production in the world. So it's going to take time for those companies to build up their capabilities to be able to convert more of our plastic. But the great news is there are people that are out there that are trying to make a difference. Now, the biggest question here, and you guys got a good laugh out of earlier, why is a finance guy telling us about this new technology? I want to tell you a little bit about my evolution on sustainability. For me, sustainability, I remember hearing about it early in my career, and I, I would see it as a line item in somebody's budget and think, what, what are we spending this on? I, I, I don't understand this initiative. And I remember having conversations with my colleagues where we'd say, why are we spending on this? We can't afford this. Remember, we had 50 other projects that we're trying to invest in. Why is this one bubbling to the top? That was my initial exposure. After a period of time, though, I've had a paradigm shift, a period of time where I've actually received some education and a better understanding. Two things that come out of it. One, I've realized that our customers actually want us to do good things for the environment. And they'll reward us if we do the right thing as a company. Two, I've also realized that we as business leaders, and in any case, when we, when we were talking about our costs, we can actually reduce our costs, improve our bottom line when we use and initiate green projects. 
things that are good for the environment. When you think about your windmills, your solar panels, your uh, LED lights, there are actually bottom line benefits for doing these green initiatives. And what I've seen in myself and in my peers is that that evolution has led to the CFO to becoming now the champion of sustainability in their companies. Rather than saying at the beginning, stop doing green, I can't afford it. The CFOs are now saying, bring me more green initiatives, we can't afford not to do it. So with that in mind, I really want to get to the heart of my message today. And I have two, two different things, two different groups I want to speak to. First, I want to speak to businessmen and women. People who are in the mix right now trying to do something to make a difference. Three thoughts for you. One, are we creating businesses that can survive? Not just the quarter, not just the year, not just the next long-term plan cycle, but for the long haul. Are we creating sustainable businesses? And in conjunction with that, are we creating an environment where our employees, our customers, our families actually can thrive and survive the future? And finally, from the business community, I want to make sure that we understand that people are not going to choose a sustainable solution if it doesn't compete with a non-sustainable solution. It's at least got to be in the mix. It's got to be competitive on cost. It's got to be competitive on the technological benefits. We need to make sure that we're bringing forth ideas that actually make this world better. So that was my first group that I wanted to talk to. I wanted to talk to businessmen and women. But now let me talk to all of us, all of us, when it comes to sustainability. And the real question here is, are we willing to put in the work and effort to come up the, learn, the evolution curve on sustainability? What are we willing to do to make a difference? Realizing that when we buy something, we're making a vote. When we say that we want a certain kind of product and we let it be known, we're making a vote. We have a lot of power as consumers. And let's make sure that we use that power. Let's get educated on what's in it for us. Because everyone wants to be sustainable. And we can't afford not to be. Thank you. But now let me talk to all of us. All of us. Okay, I think... Um... يعني هذول الفيديوهات اللي شفتوهم enlightening videos about sustainability about finance يعني هذا الزلمه finance CFO كانه يعني chief financial officer وملاحظ انه كم درجة اهتمامهم في هذا في البيئة والى اخره ف يعني بنلاحظ آه بانه هذول الفيديوهات مختلفه شوي عن بعضها آه بس خلينا آه نطلب منكم انه كل فيديو من هاي الفيديوهات الثلاثه اللي شفناهم اللي هو هذا وهذا ومايكل آه سينيك ايضا راح نشوف كيف آه نوفره اوكي هذول الفيديوهات الثلاث يعني مايكل سينيك ممكن نجيبه مره ثانيه ونقول له تعال ونقول مايك سايمون سينيك عفوا سايمون سايمون سينيك ممكن نحط مثلا اه هي هون برضو اوكي هذا اللينك تبعه ممكن يكون في لينك اخر لانه هذا يمكن مش كريديبل اكثر بس ممكن تحط سايمون سينيك بس تحط زي ما انا حطيت هنا سايمون سينيك بيبول دونت باي وات يو دو دونت باي وات يو دو ذي باي واي يو دو ات وهي الخارطه تبعته الشهيره اللي هو واي ان ذا سنتر اللي الكور عندنا واي وليس هاو اند وات في منطق لكن المنطق هذا بيفتقد للسستينابيليتي 
ويفتقد للإثيكال أسبكتس يعني منطق إذا كان واي فيها منطق وفيها أخلاق وفيها سستينابيلتي متساوية مع الكاستمر فما فيش مشكلة بس سؤال آخر بيطرح نفسه هل الكاستمر راشنال تواد سستينابيلتي اوف كورس نوت لأن الكاستمر بده أشياء سهلة بده أشياء ممتعة بده أشياء يعني انترتينمنت بده وهذا السبب في الماس برودكشن في الانتاج الواسع النطاق اللي ظهر منذ الثوره الصناعيه لحد الان لانه الكاستمر بده خلينا ننتج انتج قد ما قد ما تقدر بروديوس سيل ماركت هاي الايديز يعني يعني ات ات هي حلقه لا تنتهي يعني انفنتي في الموضوع اذا احنا بدنا زي ما بده الكاستمر والكاستمر از نوت اولويز رايت يعني الكاستمر بدخن وهل الدخان وشركات الدخان اللي صنعت الدخان او الخمور او الحشيش او المخدرات الكاستمر بده اياها الكاستمر طلبها بس اي نوع من الكاستمر فالراشناليتي والعقلانيه والمنطقيه تبعت الماركت او الكاستمر مش مفيده للسستينابيلتي في كثير من الاحيان هي بتفكر بالوقت الحاضر وما بتفكرش في المستقبل بتفكرش في التعريف اللي حكينا عن السستينابيلتي للاجيال القادمه وبقاء الامور للاجيال القادمه الله يعطيكم العافيه شوفوا لنا هذول الفيديوهات ركزوا عليهم واعطونا كل فيديو ايش اهم خمس دروس او كي وورد ممكن نناقشهم في محاضرة يوم الأحد حول هذا الموضوع هذا الموضوع ممكن يأخذ جزء كبير من المحاضرة بالإضافة للقصة اللي راح ترويها أو يرويها اللي عليه رواية القصص في السستينابيلتي في المحاضرة القادمة لسه مش عارف مين اللي راح يكون القائمة موجودة على كل حال بس أنا مش متذكر والله يعطيكم العافيه وهي المحاضره اللي هي غير متزامنه سبورت للمحاضره اللي هي المتزامنه اللي بنعطيها يوم الاحد والسلام عليكم